What is up, good people? Jungle Inc. here. I have Minus Wells, and we have Colin, the founder and also CEO of PreSearch. Really excited to talk about this. Uh, thank you for joining us, Colin. My pleasure. Thanks. Yeah, Appreciate thanks, it. Colin. You know, if you can just give a quick rundown for the uh, people in the audience, just kind of some bit backstory. What is PreSearch? Uh, what is the project all about? Yeah, so PreSearch is a decentralized search engine. Uh, we reward people with pre tokens when they search and we've built an entire ecosystem around pre. So we have, uh, a decentralized node platform that, uh, we, we've currently got about 28, 29,000 nodes, uh, operating on those node operators are rewarded with pre, uh, they participate basically in the search ecosystem and, and help, uh, uh obtain results for searchers. And then uh, to kind of close the loop on the token economy, we have an advertising platform that uses something called keyword staking, uh, where you choose whatever keyword you want your ad to show up on, and then you stake your tokens to that keyword and whoever stakes the most has their ad displayed. And we've been around since 2017. We've got about 2.3, 2.4 million registered users uh, doing about 1.6 million searches a day currently. Wow. Yeah, you know, we're talking about a project here. A lot of times you look at stuff and, and you just want to invest in a coin and see it go up in value, but this really has some substance. Uh, Colin, can you talk about the importance of a decentralized uh, search engine opposed to what we're used to, where you might have something that runs on centralized uh, servers and is really under the control of, you know, a company, a centralized party? Yeah, so, so I mean, kind of the genesis of the company, uh, uh, the project was was back in 2011, actually, and uh, I, I've got another company called ShopCity.com, and I uh, ran into just this weird incident with Google where they were blocking our sites and uh, couldn't get the issue resolved, ended up uh, participating in an FTC investigation into Google's monopolistic practices on the web. Uh, ended up getting it resolved, but in the process realized just how much market power that single company has on the internet. 92% of all searches flow through Google and just started thinking about, uh, you know, how centralized uh, the internet had become with that dependency on, on Google and how much influence they had uh, in, in, you know, the incident we had. I mean, they almost put the, the business under and, uh, and, you know, we realized that this had happened to thousands and thousands of other businesses and projects. And so just started thinking about uh, ways to kind of level that playing field, uh, came up with the concept uh, for pre-search, uh, thought of it as kind of the Switzerland of search in a way that you could search multiple resources. And so uh, that was, was really kind of how it was founded. And at this point now, uh, it's evolved so that we do have our own uh, search results uh, interface, uh, but the, the main kind of uh, value really is that this is a community-driven project. Uh, all of the uh, team members are, are accessible in a Telegram group. People can have input into the project, and we're basically building out the decentralized infrastructure that can enable a censorship resistant, uh, you know, community driven platform that doesn't have the same bias and agenda that uh, a search engine like Google has. And uh, so as we kind of are in these weird COVID times, uh, for, for instance, and people are having a hard time accessing information, Google also obviously controls YouTube and many other resources. Uh, this is kind of a, a way for uh, people to still have, uh, you know, a, a different way to find uh, information that uh, is, is, you know, not uh, susceptible to those same uh, biases and agendas and censorship. Yeah, I think it's so important. Very few people out there understand, you know, how much control big tech has over us. And even when you look at search, how the way we find the information, what is filtered out, I think this is huge. And within blockchain, that's really what we're looking for, practical applications that we're going to use to better our lives. And I, I think for me, that's what attracts me to this project. Now, I know Minus, uh, you're really into the nodes and the rewards and the tech behind it. I know you have some questions for Colin. Yeah, on that. yeah I got some, um, some questions about that, and we can get to that in a minute. Um, Colin, when you say multiple sources, when you, when you do a pre-search, 
what type of sources are we tapping into? Yeah, so I, I mean, there, there, there's kind of two uh, two ways to approach that. So one is uh, when you are searching, and, and you'll see if you go to like presearch.org, you'll see below the search field that there are a number of different uh, logos for different resources. Uh, we've taken you know some of the more popular ones, and and also some that are targeted to our core audience of cryptocurrency enthusiasts. And so it's, it's really, you can think of it as like this federated search field that you can utilize to save time and uh, specifically for people who are web workers, people that are spending lots of time online, maybe they have a, a workflow, they're trying to uh, search different resources. For, for myself, I use Etherscan all the time. I'm constantly yeah. looking up addresses, blockchain.com. Uh, I'll, you know, be searching uh, Twitter or, you know, Google Docs sometimes. And it, it's just honestly, it's a faster, easier way for me to get into the search results pages for those individual resources rather than having to bookmark them or, or you know, search them and then pull them up and then find the search field, then run a search. It's like I can just do it from that field and then click wherever I want to direct my search. So that, that, that was kind of the first level on it. And now that we have our own uh, results page, which enables us now to display our, our own pre-search ads, uh, those are, are, you know, utilizing some of the major search engines, you know, Google and, and others, uh, as well as databases and APIs. And we can really kind of add in as many as we want and ultimately mix those in uh, however we want. We've got, you know, kind of a uh, a starting algorithm right now that's uh, kind of mashing those different results up. But the, the, the big challenge really with uh, building a search engine is the long tail of search. So you, you've got basically two categories of searches. You've got short tail, which would be, you know, your top uh, million queries, let's say across different languages. Those are the ones that are fairly common. They get lots of search volume. And, uh, you know, those ones are, are, are ones that you can kind of build out an index for uh, relatively easily. It doesn't require, you know, as much data and uh, you don't have to constantly be, be crawling the web in the same way. Long tail is, you know, all the other queries, which is, is you know, from a volume standpoint, even though some of these searches might get very few individual searches collectively because there's so many terms, it, it, it can actually, you know, outweigh the number of, of short tail searches that you have. And that is a really challenging problem. Uh, at this point, you've got basically a, an index uh, on Google. Bing has an index, which is what's powering DuckDuckGo as well. And, uh, and then Yandex, which is a, a Russian search engine. They're really the only three that have cracked this, this long tail search index uh, wow. in a way that's, that's usable. And so basically our intention is to leverage these existing indexes and then start building our own short tail index on top of it in a more decentralized way. And the, the, the nice thing is, is that generally censorship and bias happens on short tail queries, long tail queries, it's, it's really not such an issue. And so uh, we can basically, uh, you know, leverage blockchain, we can leverage yeah nodes and and we can start layering on top of these existing resources and then you know provide that complete user experience the, the thing is, is if you have a really good short tail index but you suck at long tail people run so many long tail queries that you know they don't even realize it necessarily but if you don't have quality results they will uh, go elsewhere and so you need to really have the entire thing solved out of the gate so the approach we took was you know leverage uh, existing work and then get that user experience so that it's high quality and people can actually switch to it and then start layering in our own uh, proprietary or community driven solution uh, on top of it. Yeah. And I've heard you say this before indexing is really intensive. I guess the long, long uh, portion of that. Is mm -hmm. there going to be like some type of wish list that you provide to the, the community for them to help? with this indexing or, or what plans do you have to, to build that out? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we're, we're kind of getting close to moving on to, to that. I mean, we, we've tried to get uh, more of the token economics worked out and some of the, the core you know, user interface uh, layers. And then you know, we're, we're kind of building out 
Uh, next, it'll be, you know, that, uh, that distributed decentralized index that, that also involves a, a little bit of, you know, governance. So enabling the community to participate in the curation. So whether they're yeah. staking or using negative keyword staking a, against, you know, terms uh, within, uh, within the index. And then the, the current node platform, because it's, it's primarily using these existing resources, which I should mention also provides a, a layer of privacy. So, you know, people run a, a search on, on Google and Google knows, you know, who you are and your IP and they're, right, they're backing right. that to you, right? And so in this case, it's basically the queries coming into to a node gateway. That node gateway is anonymizing that query. It's sending it out to all these different sources, but it's constantly coming from different IP addresses. There's no identifying information. And then it's rebuilding, uh, uh, the interface uh, for for the user uh, through pre-search. And so uh, the first layer right now, the, the nodes that you know you guys are running, for instance, uh, they're pretty lightweight. They don't have to be particularly intensive. and uh, and so uh, we will have different functions uh, that will include you know web crawling and, and indexing. Uh, data storage, and those will have different hardware requirements. They will also have different rewards associated with them. Nice. And nice. and so that's that's kind of you know coming down the pipe. For now, it's it's been about you know can we build a uh, a, a node platform basically, and and like the node management platform. You know the the, the ability to pass updates out to node hardware. And uh, to to be able to handle you know the connections and the disconnections and then the rewards and all those different functions and then we can just start plugging in different uh, you know hardware types different uh, device requirements uh, to handle different functions that the uh, system's going to uh, require and and so yeah we've we've you know just about got uh, that side of things uh, you know really working we're preparing to launch mainnet. Uh, in the next couple of months, and uh, and then yeah, uh, we'll start moving on to to more of the uh, the you know web crawling, indexing, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I think um, I mean if you were to tell someone, hey, you can use pre search, and Google can't censor you, and you are anonymous, people are going to say, I'm going to use pre search. So <laughs> I think I think that's just right there is just outstanding. So that alone, yeah, it's going to drive value through the roof. And I um, bet you over time, the actual quality of your searches will be better because the point is to find you what you're looking for, not again, feed you what some company thinks you want to see or censor what you're really looking for. Uh, I, I think the end product could also be superior to that what we see in, in regular search. Yeah, there, there, there's a couple of layers to it. I mean, one of the big differences between, you know, pre-search being community driven and having a, a token at the heart of the uh, the project is that it aligns the uh, the entire uh, ecosystem and all the different participants. So we're all using that same unit of value. So you know, searchers being rewarded and advertisers uh, utilizing it. A you know, kind of crowdfunding uh, project backer and supporter, uh, team members, uh, ultimately curators and node operators certainly. We're, we're all aligned around delivering the best experience possible for our community because uh, it's kind of a, a rising tide uh, type situation. Whereas if, if you're you know, running a traditional search engine, you've got equity holders, uh, you've got venture capitalists that initially back the, the you know, company, uh, and then you've got users and then you've got advertisers wow. and nobody's aligned, right? So if you right. think about it, like the advertiser is trying to like, hey, how much data can I get? How can I sell more stuff? I want more information, which is where that, you know, invasion of privacy comes from. The user, they want the best results possible, but at the same time, especially in the case of Google, like they don't even know what the best results possible are because we're just kind of reliant and we're assuming, oh, well, that must just be the best set of results. And then you've got the, the VCs who are basically just looking for, uh, you know, an exit uh, and, and then ultimately kind of your public company shareholders who are just looking ultimately at profit. And so there's all this misalignment. And so, uh, having everybody aligned is really huge, definitely. And then the, the other thing is enabling the community to actually like hold the project accountable 
and to participate in the in the curation. It's not like this weird black box that uh, none of us really understands how it works or why it does the things it, it does. And so, uh, you know, those those two things are really important. And then like the, the third kind of layer on it is uh, we have these open source community packages. If you go to our, our GitHub repo uh, and anybody basically with, with HTML and JavaScript experience can build a UI for a, a result uh, panel. So if you go on to pre-search and you search for like Bitcoin, for instance, you'll see we have a, a crypto info package that oh. is pulling information from APIs to, to deliver on page uh, kind of detailed results on top of the, you know, kind of natural search results that link out to other sources. And so, so basically anybody can start building these crypto packages or, or sorry, uh, community packages. And, uh, and then we can basically trigger them on different keywords. And so ultimately over time, as this picks up steam, you're going to get people who are very knowledgeable about a niche and they're going to be, you know, knowing, well, here's what matters for that niche. And they'll be building out these uh, dedicated UIs that we can then call. And so, I mean, G Google has like, you know, over 100,000 employees, but most of them don't work on search. There's probably, you know, five to 10,000, we estimate that actually work on search. And they're, they're, you know, very much a top down organization. And so if you think about this, like all these bottom up opportunities that, uh, they would never be able to even uncover. We could get really passionate people who are, are uh, enthusiasts about that specific uh, niche, uh, building out this UI that is like super rich and relevant. And so ultimately, yeah, you could end up with, you know, a better overall search experience. Wow. And I think that's really the, the point. And that's what excites yeah. me about this. We're leveraging blockchain for a real purpose. Yes. Real purpose. Yeah. And, um, before we move on from this, and I don't want to really get too technical here, but I, I was listening to Trey give a couple speeches about um, web crawling, AI, and machine learning. And um, you know, generally, would you just explain what web crawling is, and and maybe touch on a little bit uh, generally about integration of AI and machine learning into pre-search. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, ultimately, yeah, Trey, Trey's the one to uh, get into any detail, but uh, web crawling, essentially how it works. Uh, so you, you've got, you know, this, this vast internet, you've got billions and billions of documents and uh, they're, you know, they've, they've all got kind of different attributes. They've got language, they've got uh, the content. There are, are uh, what are known as uh, meta information, so things like the title of the document, uh, when it was created, if, if there's any kind of special characteristics to it, things like if it's a review page, does it have a, a rating system out of five stars, does it have, uh, you know, local information, does it have uh, some type of social information, are there preview images, all those kinds of things, and, and so essentially a web crawler is a piece of software that can identify all the distinct kind of documents, URLs, the, the, uh, the website addresses for these documents. And as it uh, basically hits one of these, these URLs, which it represents a document, it then kind of takes all that information and it starts structuring it. So if you think about the internet, it's like totally unstructured. All the, the you know, uh, Pages are, are different. They've got different content. There's, uh, you know, all different formats. There's, there's, you know, pages that are dynamic that update all the time. There are ones that are static that never change. Uh, and, and so it basically is this piece of software that can at a high level kind of identify what type of page it is and how to access kind of the common attributes that, that are uh, important in determining the information that's on the page and what it what it might mean. And so they kind of, you know, it hit this page. And then as part of it, it scans on this page for any links to any other pages. And that's why they call it a crawler. It's kind of this like recursive process where it's it's, you know, it it goes, it scans, it finds links, and then each link is to another document. Then it's it goes like investigating that document, for you. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yes. And 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 so that's kind of how it, it, it can operate in this. 
uh, kind of uh, you know distributed way where it's it's accessing like this just distributed information. It's not like somebody told it, hey, here's where all the information is. It's finding the information and it's finding all these different documents. And, and then it's it's basically you know building a database of, of all the structured information for those documents. And then from there, uh, you're, you're basically uh, indexing it. And so you're, you're, you're then starting to make sense of that information. And you're starting to look at things like, you know, well, how many, uh, like, like the core of what Google uses is something called PageRank. And it, it you know, looks at a, a hybrid of, of a bunch of different factors, but it, it's basically trying to determine credibility and relevance. And it's looking at kind of like authority for a domain name, authority for a web page, and then seeing where it links to. And so if you have a page where you have all these authoritative pages that are linking into it, then that is kind of conferring authority onto that page. And, and that uh, combined with like the on-page content and some of the other factors that they look at is how they determine, you know, what might be a good result to serve up relative to whatever query you have typed in and then any of the other information that they have, uh, whether that's, you know, location or language uh, or, you know, in Google's case, they're profiling you. And so they kind of, oh, you've been clicking on this kind of stuff. Well, you might like this. Uh, and, and so it's, it's that whole kind of process. And like the machine learning is, is really just, you know, establishing kind of these rule sets that, uh, you know, hey, this, this is, you know, this type of page, or this is, uh, it, it, you know, we've worked with a, a, a guy, Greg Lindell, uh, he was one of the early advisors that we brought on. And uh, he built uh, with a guy, Rich Screnta, a search engine called Pleco, back in 2010 to around 2015. And, and you know, he built the, a proprietary crawler. And, and one of the key things that, that his crawler looked at was like, what is the web technology that is powering the server that's serving that document because one of the biggest challenges having an independent web crawler is it, it can as you're doing this kind of recursive process uh, it can be a really intensive process uh, that the, the you know destination web server has to be able to handle so oh the crawler came to you know uh, minus.com and, and now it's like, you know, boom, 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 recursively going through all the different pages uh, on the site. Well, the server might all of a sudden be like, oh, wow, you know, I've never had, you know, 10 or 20 page requests a, a, a second hitting me. And it might actually bog the server down and it might cause uh, either an automated process or the webmaster might, uh, you know, actually block that crawler. Uh, from, from happening and, and, and being able to access the resource. And it specifically happens when it's like an unknown crawler because, you know, it's not like just Google has a crawler. Man, there's like hundreds of crawlers, all these different uh, search engines and all these just different resources, data miners. They've all got uh, all these, these kind of tentacles that are going out there with their own crawlers. And so you actually need to, as a, a webmaster or as a platform, specifically larger platforms that are using user generated content, uh, you need to have like a crawler strategy where, where, you know, some of them you might just be blocking outright because there's no value to you as a webmaster. They're just harvesting your information oh. and, uh, you know, they might not be driving any traffic of value. And so you might just have them blocked. And so if you're unknown out of the gate, uh, you've got to ensure that you don't get blocked because then you have kind of a black hole on a domain name or within, you know, an area of the internet that you can't access information from. And so what Greg's thing did, it, you know, would look at the type of web server and part of his machine learning algorithm was determining, okay, based on the type of web server, this is actually how I should crawl it. This is what's going to not overwhelm the server. This is what's not going to trigger an alert. And so, you know, there's, there's just so many layers to it. Uh, it. You know, crawling in and of itself is, you know, very challenging. And uh, there's, there's, you know, a lot of people that, that specialize in just different aspects of crawling uh, that, you know, will need to be involved as we build this out further and further. It's, it's like each layer you pull back, there's 10 other things to think about. This is <laughs> oh, totally, man. Pretty nuts. <laughs> it, it is nuts. Honestly, that's why like no, <laughs> not that many people really do it. Uh, you know, like, like 
first thing we did when we launched pre-search, so, so we got really lucky. So uh, 2017, June of 2017, kind of decided, okay, we're doing this. We were mainly, you know, driven by the fact that, hey, we need some type of decentralized search engine. Uh, nobody else was doing it. Couldn't find anybody else who was, was doing it. Uh, thought, hey, you know what? Uh, why, why not us? And put out a, a white paper and basically said, hey, you know, we don't know exactly how we're going to do this, but we believe that uh, there's a huge need and that we are doing this for the right reasons and that, when we put this out there, the right people will make themselves known and they will help this project evolve. And so as soon as we, we did that, like literally like the day that the white paper went live on Bitcoin talk, Trey got in touch with me and he was like, dude, I'm a crypto investor. Uh, I'm a search engine guy. I'm, you know, SVP of engineering at Lucidworks. We're the largest open source search firm in the world. Uh, love what you're doing. Love the mission. Always wanted to do something like this. Had an idea kind of like this. Uh, I'm interested in getting involved, you know, can I buy some tokens and can I be an advisor? Uh, oh, and by the way, you said this, 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 and this, and uh, to those in the know, it, it's not the right thing. You should say it like this and just started advising right off the bat and delivering value. And so Trey got involved kind of right off the hop. It took a, a, a number of years for things to line up for him to come on full-time as a CTO, but right after kind of him ended up reaching out. I knew of this, this Rich Sprenta guy from Blecko. And so reached out to him, hey, Rich, would you come on in as advisor? He, uh, at the time, was an executive director at uh, IBM Watson, and uh, IBM had acquired his search engine. And he knew, you know, all kind of the ins and outs and specifically what not to do. He was like, dude, it's really hard. D don't, you know, make these mistakes, please. You know, we raised 70 million. We spent 30 million on servers. Uh, wow. Don't do that, <laughs> you know. And uh then from like the reward side of things, I, I knew about this uh, project. It was one of the first viral internet uh, products. It was called alladvantage.com. It was in like 98, 99. I was uh, like first year of college kind of thing. And, and this thing went viral. And, and in the program that I was in, we had uh, mobile computing. So we all had laptops. And uh, there, there was a guy in our, our uh, you know, one of our classes that had discovered this thing and they had it was basically, it was get paid to surf was their, their catch line. And uh, they had this piece of software you would install on your computer. And then as you were surfing the web, it had basically a banner ad that would be displayed at the top in the middle of the screen. And as long as you were surfing, uh, they would pay you to basically have this banner in your view. And, and, uh, and then they had this referral program around it where it was like a multi-level thing where you could refer other people and, and so the guy that introduced us was making like thousands of dollars a month off of it. I was making, you know, a couple of hundred bucks a month, but uh, we, we were all getting these, it was physical checks at the time. It was hilarious. Wow. And uh, so, so I knew of this thing and I knew kind of like it blew up hard. They raised like 200 and something million. And within like two years, it was gone. They were just like nuts with money. They had, you know, Bill Clinton speak at their, uh, at their Christmas party. And I think you too, or somebody insane like that. Uh, was playing. So these guys, it was like dot com boom, and they were just pissing away money. But on top of it, it was this this rewards model. And and so there was the the guy who started it as uh, an older guy named Jim Jorgensen. And so uh, I I reached out to him. Uh, they were all in Silicon Valley, of course. And so I went out and I, you know, had lunch with Jim and I'm like, dude, here's what we're trying to do. And you know, get paid to search, get paid to surf. Uh, are you interested in getting involved as an advisor? He was like, this is Bitcoin, right? Like, yeah. He's like, I'm too old for this, man. I don't need any more black guys. I've already made enough mistakes in my business career. This whole business thing, I don't know, or, or sorry, the Bitcoin thing. I think the government's going to crack down on it. He's like, but I'll tell you what, here's my, my advice. And, and he, you know, kind of spilled the beans on how they ultimately uh, got somewhat successful at dealing with fraud and abuse. Uh, they had like 50 people full time doing it. And uh, anyways, just kind of, you know, found people, picked their brains and uh, started, uh, you know, building out kind of the, the prototype and uh, had a working version with a working ad platform before we actually launched the token on November 9th of 2017. Wow. You know, it's interesting you bring up that time frame, I, you know, stuff like pay for search or like net zero where you're getting free internet and all mm -hmm. the different, you know, search uh, search engines that were out in those days, and just a lot of interesting stuff going on uh, on that era of the internet. 
Uh, yep. Giants were born from there. And of course, a lot of stuff fizzled out. I feel yep. like we're kind of there with blockchain as well. Just a lot of interesting stuff. Some very yep. successful projects are going to you know, come out of this. And uh, it's just an exciting time to be on blockchain. It, it is. I mean, if, if you're talking, you know, in reference to the internet, we probably are like, you know, 1998 still. A lot of people don't realize it, like how early they are, uh, because, you know, te technology itself has and, and, you know, kind of all those foundational layers. We've got high speed Internet. We've got mobile devices. Uh, you know, there's social networks. We've got YouTube and all these kind of go to market channels. And, and so, you know, it makes it a lot easier to kind of spread things and to have some degree of, of you know, impact uh, more easily. And so it seems like, you know, Bitcoin and crypto and everything's kind of more pervasive, but, you know, relative to still like, you know, retail spending, uh, you know, anything, uh, you know, financial, really, I mean, even though the market cap of crypto is whatever, two trillion, I mean, it's, it's nothing, <laughs> you know, we're so early, we're 1998 right now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just starting to get those, those applications and uh, the use case and kind of the, the technology to the point where now it's becoming like a usable thing, like what happened in, you know, 2000 when yeah. all of a sudden high speed internet and Google comes out and all of a sudden the internet just explodes. And, you know, it's interesting because from a governmental standpoint, regu regulatory wise, similar, you know, they kind of ignored the internet up until all of a sudden it just hit this kind of turning point and all of a sudden, boom, now it's huge. And, uh, you know, they're starting to have those conversations. Uh, so, yeah, I, th I think just from a kind of uh, relative standpoint, that's where we are in this cycle. And one last thing, you know, what I find interesting during that whole time where you have all this interesting stuff launching, you know, I really couldn't be part of that from the foundational level. But with blockchain, we're able to invest in that, of course, by having tokens and, and really being part of this whole revolution. So I think to me, that is uh, extremely exciting. Now, Minus and my buddy Russ, they're always telling me about node projects and, and, and that is an investment vehicle. And I always ignore it. And then it, the thing seems to go parabolic and then you can't afford a <laughs> node when you wait. Can we talk a little bit about that, about how the nodes work and, and that is an investment opportunity? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the, the, the way we think about it, we think about it as, you know, it's an infrastructure play for, for us. And it's a marketing play. So you kind of have these two things that are that are tied together. Uh, and so uh, we want to create kind of as wide a footprint as possible, uh, you know, have lots of redundancy, have have a resilient network. Uh, and, and that's kind of, you know, the performance side of things. And then we have the marketing side of things. And we look at, you know, go to market strategy for the project. I mean, we've had some some pretty, you know, successful uh, campaigns. And we're fortunate that, you know, <laughs> thanks to this antitrust thing in Europe, uh, we ended up getting included as a, a default search option within the Android ecosystem, which is, is huge and definitely driving significant growth and usage for us. But then, you know, we look at like, who are some of our best advocates? Who are people that are, are spreading the word that are helping to build the community, build the brand, help us in, improve the technology, the people that are really kind of, you know, vested stakeholders in the project, moving things forward and, and helping it to propagate. And, and that, you know, kind of ties in more on the, the marketing side of things, which uh, from a reward standpoint, I mean, we can, we're basically incentivized to way overspend, you know, the, the, infrastructure requirements for the project because it's a great go-to-market uh, channel for for reaching new users and for reaching you know passionate users and and influential users and so you know we're kind of mashing all these things up uh, into this this opportunity and so I mean we've had yeah huge growth specifically over the past month uh, we went from 10,000 yeah. nodes to over, almost 30,000 nodes in the past month it took us you know from January until, uh, you know, end of August to get to 10,000. And then from, you know, September 1st until October 1st to, to double, tri triple that. Um, and, and so, yeah, there's been a lot of interest. Uh, we're, we're still running just those, those nodes on testnet. So it's, it's just, 
you know, if you go to, uh, there's a, a specific URL and uh, you can add it in as a pre-search provider uh, so that you're searching testnet powered, uh, like node powered search results. Uh, but that's really all the nodes are, are, you know, powering right now. So we're basically, uh, you know, kind of over incentivizing uh, definitely on the uh, infrastructure side of things. I mean, the actual usage of the nodes right now, I mean, you probably see it if you're running them, they're not getting a ton of searches yet. So as we go to right. mainnet, we're going to start, you know, seeing that actual infrastructure uh, uh, kind of involvement uh, ratchet up. And then, you know, as we have just more of these layers in place, it makes more sense for us to ratchet up marketing as well and incentivize people uh, more on the reward side of things. And, you know, the more buzz that we create, I mean, ultimately for pre-search to be a top 100 project on uh, coin market cap, I mean, 20. that has huge marketing value. That alone is going to drive, you know, a huge number of crypto users. And so, you know, there's kind of all these, these things at play, uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, I think you're going to be more than top 100 for sure in the next three years. Um, but, okay, so node operators, you know, right now you get a little bit more, more reward when you stake a whole bunch. And I think you, you clarified that when it switches the main net, it's not going to matter if you're staking a, a thousand coins or ten thousand coins. It's all going to be pretty uniform. And I think you also said, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, when main, mainnet launches, you're going to be relying on the nodes to do, I think, 100% of the work, which is going to increase rewards. And then, um, it, and that might be because uh, more searches are going to be going towards our nodes. The nodes are going to be handling more of the of the search uh, power processing power? Yeah. So, so basically right now the nodes are handling just, you know, the queries that are done on testnet. And so that once it goes to mainnet and we've got our, you know, current 1.6 million by then, it'll be probably significantly more searches every day. Uh, you know, the, the infrastructure uh, component comes into play it, it on the, the rewards for staking, there is actually definitely a benefit to staking more. And, and you know, so, some people, I mean, we, we almost need to normalize a little bit potentially. Like some people are staking a lot. You know, we've got uh, some people who uh, are, you know, in really early in the project and, and you know, they're staking a really significant number of, of tokens, but it, it, it can certainly, uh, you know, really make a, a difference uh, on the rewards. And there's kind of, a, you know, some interesting opportunities ultimately uh, that that could come into play with like you know node node security and ways to like secure your node uh, as we start and and we're looking at doing a, a hardware device as well. We talked about that on our weekly update today, so we've already got a prototype for a a pre-search branded uh, Raspberry Pi powered oh, wow. device. Yeah, and uh, and so, so we as can we just do buy that, that, we can just purchase that and then plug it in and it runs. Exactly. And that's going to be a different type of tier. Is that going to handle more or less resources than our uh, VPSs? It, 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 it's it, at this point, uh, because uh, Raspberry Pi are fairly lightweight devices, they'll be doing basically the same workload okay. as uh, a, a VPS. But it, it kind of gives us additional, uh, you know, distribution and 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 more of a decentralized network because we're not running so much in these these data centers. We're running, you know, at that point, right, like, right. individual, you know, the devices that are plugged into a, a home internet connection or a business internet connection. But at that point, then we need to really be even more concerned about filtering and enabling people to like, you know, filter out different types of queries and stuff that they wouldn't want, obviously, their IP address to be associated with. And so um, there, there could be some interesting roles as far as staking goes there and, you know, different devices and uh, ability just to kind of, you know, filter out traffic or filter in and process different types of queries. There, there, there's a whole bunch of different stuff that, that can kind of come into play ultimately around like trusted users, trusted nodes, and, uh, you know, staking really kind of plays into that uh, in a really interesting way. We haven't really fleshed that out totally yet, but uh, I, I, I'm pretty excited about the potential for what we're going to be able to do on the staking side. Yeah. And then uh, keyword staking, you know, I played around with that a little bit. I, I staked um, the word yeah. Twitter 
for a while. Yep. Just so everyone that searched Twitter would see my minus Wells ad pop up. But <laughs> yep. I mean, it seemed, you know, obviously it's not uh, main net, not a lot of searches are going through it right now, but it seemed like it was an awful lot of the pre that I had to stake to be that number one spot to get my ad listed. Yep. And, you know, when this thing goes parabolic a little bit, um, you know, on the price 10 X's and now to be one of the, to, to get, to be the lead for a key word, it's going to cost a ton of money. And yeah. It's, it, I, I, I think we're going to see like kind of over time, you're going to just see uh, all the different uh, token economics uh, come into play where, you know, people will be, uh, you know, th th there are early adopters right now that were able to buy pre-search tokens at, you know, different values, and they are right. essentially, you know, overstaking uh, compared to maybe the economic impact when the token is at a different price. And so I, I, I think like as time goes on, you're going to see just a constant shifting and you, you'll ultimately see kind of a balance uh, come into into effect, just like it has with Google AdWords. I mean, it's an auction driven system. And, uh, you know, ultimately, uh, we can do things like, you know, introduce uh, cost per click, we, there currently is none of that involved that would, you know, potentially disincentivize people from, you know, kind of squatting on keywords, if, if it feels that way. Um, but but yeah, the, the keyword seeking itself, I'm, I'm really excited about, you uh, the potential there and uh, the the way that we can you know start to really utilize staking to represent value within the ecosystem and I mean ultimately the the main value is uh, you know from a marketing and and you know uh, uh, traffic standpoint the ability to have uh, you know whether it's commercial uh, you know businesses or or people just who want to, uh, you know, they've got a message and they want to get it in front of people. Uh, I, I think staking is uh, a much more elegant way to uh, kind of communicate value and uh, ensure that ultimately uh, keywords are, are not, you know, squatted upon and that there's value that's, that's being uh, obtained from both the searcher and from uh, the keyword staker. Uh, but yeah, we're still like really early days. We're basically still running off of like the prototype prototype version of uh, the keyword seeking engine that we built in uh, 2020. So uh, right now focuses on go to market, uh, adding a lot of new users and driving uh, new uh, or driving repeat usage. So that's why we've been kind of working on the, the new search UI that we rolled out a, a week or two ago. And, uh, you know, the mobile apps that we've rolled out this year and and just trying to, to make it so that when somebody finds out about pre-search and they start using it, that they stick around. And as we get that really dialed in, then it's about, you know, going and getting a whole bunch more users, specifically North America and Europe. And then as we have that audience, then the utility value of the tokens within keyword staking really increases. And at that point, then we're going to be really doubling down on the keyword staking engine and, and making it, you know, more robust and handling things uh, just, you know, a, a little bit more robustly uh, than we are right now. Yeah. Now you guys at... real quick, I don't want you to go on from that because you've seriously piqued my interest here. So when I'm staking a keyword, is there any right now burn factor to that? Or as long as I have my coin staked there, I'm getting that advertising. But if I want to pull all my coins back, I can. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's the second scenario. So there's currently no cost per click. There's no consumptive charge for clicks or for views. It's uh, just, yeah, based on whatever you, you put up. And uh, so, yeah, ultimately that's that, you know, will uh, likely change, but uh, we haven't still kind of, you know, decided on, on what that would look like. And I mean, there's, there, there's, there's a whole bunch of different models actually that, uh, uh, we can ultimately explore. So, so yeah, that, that that's going to be fun to really get that dialed in. From my mind, as a tokenomic standpoint, you know, people are going to the market and buying these coins to get that advertising. I mean, yep. that's just pulling coins out the market. That you can think of all the very valuable search terms that this would happen for across the board. I mean, that's absolutely massive. And then from an advertiser standpoint, yeah, I got to put some cash up front, but I'm going to get it back. I mean, that just seems like a win across the board. And 
again, I'm just extrapolating there, uh, you know, as we get more users and people will be interested in that. I mean, I think that's a huge driver of value for this coin where you want a keyword, you better go, you know, get that value out the market and stake for it. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. And, and yeah. right now, um, like I, I was searching for the most popular searches and I, I was looking at like term, keywords, crypto and stuff like that. And Binance had, I forget what it was, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Binance was staking 10 million coins to one of the most common crypto searches out there. And I was, you know, I was thinking, well, how, how do I compete with that? Because, you know, not even minus can compete with 10 million coins. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, it kind of seems like, like that's a flaw. Like whoever's got the most money gets all the, you know, centralized money can buy these coins and get all the advertisements for certain keywords. Yeah. Well, they got all the advertising and the regular one. I mean, I can't compete with the heavy hitters for regular keywords on Google or, or, you know, any other search engine, I, I don't have the funding that they do, but I sure can, if I buy some of these coins, I might have that, you know, firepower soon enough. Well, that, that, that's it. I mean, there's an early adopter, you know, benefit certainly within the, the system as within any crypto ecosystem. Uh, I mean, those who are, are in first generally, uh, you know, end up with a, a much different, uh, you know, ability to participate than, than those who come, you know, later, and I, I think, you know, ultimately, uh, you are going to just see, you know, again, more kind of distribution uh, happening over time. Uh, we, we've got a lot of, you know, keyword stakers right now that are early adopters that are kind of like set it and forget it uh, at, at this point. Uh, but ultimately, you know, there are ways that you can uh, creatively, I mean, so, so you might think that, you know, the term crypto is the one that you want, but truthfully, that might be a term that doesn't get as much traffic as a derivative uh, that has multiple terms within it. And you can sometimes stake those for like a thousand pre. And, and so it's, it's honestly, there's almost like a mining opportunity where you're mining, uh, you know, different combinations of words. And you're ultimately trying to find the ones that yes, have a lot of traffic, but also ones that convert for whatever the offer is that you have. And uh, we have a lot of people who are running, you know, not a ton of pre, but they're getting like huge results from the, from the, the system. Wow. And yeah, like, like the keyword staking is really about, uh, you know, front loading demand and, and, you know, having people just want to buy the, the, the tokens in order to do the staking rather than trying to earn it back into the system uh, off of the, the, the clicks. And so, you know, we kind of have, a, a few unique opportunities for the the, the project uh, to kind of you know generate uh, uh, ongoing revenue and and ongoing you know token income back into the the project and we're also looking at things like you know right now for instance search rewards are all paid out in pre but uh, we might move to a model at some point in the future where you know it's other projects that are providing the rewards for the day let's say and you're getting you know tokens from a different crypto and uh that becomes the incentive to use pre-search it becomes the marketing vehicle for them they're giving out tokens instead of having to pay cash and and you know the actual reward itself that you get uh, you know on a daily basis or whatever might not be pre it might be something else and yeah. so then we can decrease our requirements for for pre rewards and so there's kind of all these different opportunities uh main thing is you know can we uh build that marketplace and get that ecosystem where we've got a significant number of users and so far you know we have been able to we've got one of the most used projects in all of crypto and then it's about you know building out that and and understanding the needs of the different sponsors and the different participants within the ecosystem and enabling them to participate in building out, you know, the, the systems that they need and, and, you know, really viewing it as uh, more of a coordination marketplace than just a straight up marketplace. We want to enable them to, you know, kind of determine how they're going to coordinate themselves uh, within the environment rather than just, you know, hey, we set all the rules and this is how it works. Uh, so, so yeah, there's, there's a ton of potential uh, and it's really about, you know, getting eyeballs, getting that transactional intent that you have when you're searching, which is just hugely valuable. It's, it's you know, some, some cost per click uh, values with Google are like hundreds of dollars, you know, wow. because 
it, you're, you're looking for these these people that are doing this really high value activity and and you know when they're searching for it the nice thing about it with respect to it being a private search engine is you don't need all the demographic information the profiling information they're indicating whatever their intent for that transaction is just by the keyword that they're expressing and so it's it's you know a really i mean that's why duck duck goes done so well those guys are making tons of money hugely valuable they're just running the bing api and the and the microsoft bing ads uh, you know monetization engine but that's why they're advertising all over the world on all these you know different media and 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 truthfully paving the way for us because now all we we're gonna have to do is just go steal DuckDuckGo users. It's a lot easier once they've <laughs> identified them, right? Yeah. But uh, anyways, they're doing it because they're they're doing so well from it, and uh, so yeah, I don't know, just huge value, and and it, it's just gonna be you know kind of a I, I think a pretty fun process to uh, bring all these different participants participants together to build out this ecosystem. Yeah, you know, I'm a I'm a big flux guy too recently uh -huh. and and i know that in their decentralized web um, they you can host um free search in in some way and i'm not yes. not exactly sure how we're hosting you compared to running a node um up in the decentralized cloud there but yeah you know, is that is that part of the uh the ecosystem that you're talking about here Absolutely. Yeah. On, on the node infrastructure side of things, I mean, right now it's, it's probably, you know, like as hard as it's, it's going to get from a, a setup standpoint, you, you at this point generally need to, uh, you know, kind of get your, your hosting environment set up and install Docker. And then you've got to be able to run some, some basic commands to kind of get things up and running. But ultimately, I mean, like, like, and you can see it, like if you go into pre-search nodes, uh, telegram group, I mean, now we've got like the CEO of, of, of rack nerds and there's, uh, you know, a, a number of different hosting companies that have realized, oh, wow, this is a huge opportunity. And, you know, where they're generally anti-crypto uh, because they they don't want crypto miners who have these insanely intensive processes, they realize that the pre-search process is very lightweight and it, it's something that, you know, they can sell and scale and uh, service uh, really without issue. And so they're now, you know, looking at different ways to, to make it easier for people to spin up a pre-search node. So ultimately it, it can be, you know, uh, hey, I want to launch a node. And I mean, obviously you'll always still be able to install it kind of, you know, fully independently, just, you know, within Docker, let's say, uh, on any device that supports, uh, that Docker supports. Uh, but we could make it so that, you know, Flux or Threefold or Strong Nodes or, or Rack Nerds or any of these guys can have like, you know, a two or three click setup where it's like, you know, start a node. Okay, here's, Here's different providers. Here's different pricing and payments uh, for them. Some of them will accept payment in crypto. Some of them, it's got to be in fiat, whatever. And okay, I pick one. And then as I, I pick one, it automatically transfers in my uh, registration code. And then it's basically, you're just setting up a payment profile within their ecosystem. And then boom, you launch your node. And, and so you don't need to know anything technical at all. And right. then it becomes super easy for for us to scale up infrastructure. Right, and then scaling up infrastructure, I mean, let's let's assume end of year, you know, Bitcoin goes up really high and, and um, you know, pre 10 X's to 1 billion market cap, or, you know, maybe, maybe even beyond. Um, um, it's my understanding that the requirements, the collateral requirements for nodes are gonna go up. Um, is, do you guys have a plan for anticipating this to, to not price people out from, from uh, getting nodes um, if the price does go up substantially? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's important to us. I mean, just kind of the, the nature of the project and, and kind of the ethos of the project. We, we don't want it to be an exclusive opportunity. We're not looking to have, you know, like multi tens of thousands, you know, for master nodes and stuff like that. I mean, ultimately there are different node opportunities and there will be things like running a gateway node or you know uh, different different right. functions that could require really significant stakes uh but uh as far as kind of the core just you know base uh node level we do want to keep it affordable 
Uh, we're definitely uh, sensitive to that. And we, we kind of need it from a distribution standpoint. We want to ensure exactly, that you know, yeah. there's a large number of nodes to handle the requests and give us that resilience and, and that redundancy. And so, I mean, yeah, there, there, there's, you know, definitely different uh, levers that we can pull. Uh, and, you know, at this point, we're basically really experimenting, you know, with, with how it works. Right now, we've had like a huge influx of nodes. We're trying to like slow it down a little bit because kind of the, the core rewards model, like we, we kind of realize, okay, you know, most people are going to probably be doing, uh, you know, running these on, on VPSs. VPSs have generally kind of a, a core, you know, monthly cost, we need to make sure that whatever the rewards are, are, are definitely covering that cost and then some. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we've got to kind of figure out what that balance looks like. That's why we're trying to, at this point, slow down to some degree, the number of actual nodes so that we can distribute rewards a little bit more to the number of existing nodes and and you know so it's it's yeah kind of experimental at this point uh and we're, we're also you know looking at really like the impact that node operators have on on the go-to-market strategy so you know we've got a hypothesis right now that node operators are excellent promoters and they help you know bring in new users and like the more that node operators prove that out then the higher the rewards are that we can uh pay out as kind of a marketing expense. And, you know, if, if it turns out, oh yeah, you know, node operators don't do anything like that and it's just infrastructure, well then that, you know, changes that equation. And so at, at this point, you know, it's kind of like on the node operators to some degree to like, hey, you know, how can you help us help you uh, by, you know, spreading the word about this project and, you know, all the different things, like, like what you guys are doing, honestly, you know, yeah, having I've, I've a done my part for sure. <laughs> you guys are doing your part. Absolutely, man. You're like you're rocking it on Twitter and you've got me on here talking about it. And so, I mean, any of those kinds of things that come out of, of the node operator community, uh, are, are massive and, uh, you know, just incentivize us to, to pay out higher rewards. So yeah, man, I appreciate what you're doing. And I, and I, I think and, and believe and hope that other node operators are, are, you know, appreciating what you guys are doing and, and being inspired. And the more that this can happen, then yeah, the more that we can, can channel into uh, node rewards. Well, I think what's exciting to me is we're starting to see applications that solve real world problems, not just blockchain problems. I think that's kind of the next evolution of this. You guys were talking about decentralized cloud services. Of course, this is decentralized search. So that's, I like seeing these usable applications, not like the clunky stuff we've been seeing. I mean, to me, this yeah. is the emergence of the future in a lot of ways. Now, be, before we go on, I just briefly want to circle back to something you brought up. When I heard of this first, Minus described it as the most bullish information he's heard of before on blockchain. Can we talk about how this now is included in Android? Because we glossed over that, and I think it's huge, huge. It is. Yeah, I mean, really, like, if you think about it, I mean, from like a, a mainstream crypto adoption standpoint, I mean, you've got exchanges, and and you've got, you know, a couple of information services, and maybe, you know, portfolio trackers that have like, you know, really significant usage. Uh, but outside of that, generally, like, like, you know, applications uh, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's kind of limited to, to ones that actually have real world kind of normal person uh, usage and, and, a, and a use case. And so, I mean, the beauty of search is that, you know, it can be a habit forming activity. It's something that people do every day. It's not like, oh, yeah, I, I searched once and then I never did it again. It's like everybody searches multiple times a day. You can definitely build habits around that. And, and you know, people will alter their user behavior and then build their own habit. And, and that's super important. And then it's really about, you know, how do you get distribution and, and get people to find out about you and get people to give you a try and, and in the case of, uh, you know, search, we're competing against the 800 pound gorilla, which is Google, which, you know, 92% market share uh, and a really obviously solid product. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in that dominant position. So, like, how do you compete against them? Well, we've already been working on, you know, and we've talked about the, the, the UI and how we can compete from an actual usability standpoint. And, and so then it's like, well, you know, distribution, how do you get that? 
And honestly, we, we have been really fortunate. Uh, you know, we've got a, a great community member, uh, Mark Dalton. He's one of our uh, main Telegram admins, been with us for many years. And he really pushed us. He's like, hey, guys, I found out about this opportunity. You know, basically in 2018, uh, the EU uh, settled uh, an antitrust complaint against Google. And, and uh, you know, there was a multi-billion dollar fine that Google paid. And then part of the, of the settlement was that they had to introduce this thing called the Android search choice screen. So previous to that, you would install Android. And of course, you know, Android is the dominant mobile operating system. It's, you know, more than 80% market penetration. And then the default browser is Chrome. Of course, it's also the biggest, you know, browser in the world from a, a market penetration standpoint, you know, probably, you know, 70 80 percent market penetration and uh then you you've got basically google is just there that's your default search engine and it's like you know especially on mobile there's no you you can't run uh, a browser extension like you can on a desktop or a laptop so for right now you know and previous you know to mobile uh you can be running Firefox or, or Brave or Chrome or whatever, and you can install the pre-search uh, desktop extension, and then uh, it'll reset uh, your search engine to pre-search away from Google. Well, on mobile, uh, it doesn't work that way. You can't use extensions. You actually have to get people using your app, and that's you know switching costs. Now you've got to move away from Chrome, and how do you get that to happen? Well, because of this uh, EU uh, situation, and so we we first looked into it in 2019 when they when they launched it. But you had to actually pay for every install, and it was like going to cost millions and millions of dollars. And we didn't have the app, we didn't have the infrastructure, we didn't have really the the go to market strategy, and so uh, you know we couldn't do it. And then uh, 2021 comes around, and they they kind of you know end up in a, another. Uh, antitrust situation. And this time part of the settlement is, okay, now you've got to make it so that the Android search choice screen has no cost to it. And so now it's like, oh, wow, that's a huge opportunity. So again, Mark identifies it. Uh, Alex on our team, head of growth, uh, basically got the application in, uh, got approved, worked with uh, our dev team and Google engineers to you know get all the requirements. And so now when somebody uh, it, you know, has a new Android device or they reinstall Chrome, uh, they get this search choice screen that basically says, which search engine do you want to use? And so we are the only one in crypto and we were able to basically put keywords in as our description. So it's, you know, a, a decentralized private blockchain based search engine. And so we kind of use those keywords that will appeal to anybody uh, who is aligned with those kind of uh, different topics and they can go in now and they just, you know, click pre-search instead of having to go through this whole process. And, and after they've already done Google, this is like, we're on a level playing field with Google. Yeah, this is huge. It's huge. Okay. And so people click it. And then next thing they, they know, they've got the pre-search mobile app, which is, you know, uh, uh, a, a full private search browser uh, and then it's got the home screen widget. So uh, that feeds queries right into the system as well. And so it's like super easy now. So we've had a huge growth in, in new users and in, in uh, queries. And what's really interesting is a lot of these people, because they're not necessarily crypto people and they didn't necessarily find out about pre-search and because we, we weren't allowed to talk about it in our description within the Android search choice screen, we couldn't say anything about rewards. So a lot of them don't even know that there is rewards. They're just huh. choosing it as it's a private search engine. And that's why like the number of queries that we're actually incentivizing with pre is just dropping and dropping. It's now 70% of them are non-incentivized. And so if we can keep building that out, man, that's like huge wind at the back of the project, right? We don't have those reward expenses for those searchers until they might at some point go, oh, wow, if I create an account, I can start earning tokens. For now, we're basically getting free searches. And, and that, you know, is feeding into the ecosystem, uh, you know, a ton of new usage. Oh, that's absolutely what you want to see, that kind of natural adoption because the product is so good, you know, yes. that people are coming to. 
you know, uh, Colin, we'll sit here and, and talk to you all night about blockchain and search and <laughs> stuff like that. But I know you're busy. I appreciate you've sat here for over an hour, but uh, either yourself or minus, is there anything else you could think uh, here? Yeah, I just had over? one last thing and it was about on your, on your way pay, or roadmap, I should say. Um, it talks about uh, setting up a bridge to reduce gas fees. And, yes. you know, we're, we're big XRP people and, you know, we love Flare Finance and all that stuff. And they, you know, they run an Ethereum virtual machine, um, which can bypass Ethereum gas pretty much completely. Um, yep. What are your thoughts on that? We, you know, just real quick. Uh, honestly, my, my core thought on it is we ultimately want to support as many blockchains as possible. So if, you know, whether it's through Chainlink or whether it's, you know, multiple bridges, we would like for people to be able to access pre on their preferred blockchain. And certainly Ethereum, you know, it's, it's, it's got kind of its, its benefits as far as just, you know, it's ubiquitous and it's, it's kind of supported uh, just about, you know, everywhere within, you know, wallets and, and, and whatnot. But uh, yeah, the costs are massive. It's created, you know, probably our biggest challenge just as far as, you know, reward distribution and stuff like that goes it just you know when we first started the project uh, you know it, it was 30 cents to do an ethereum transaction and so we kind of scaled that up to okay well if it was up to two dollars and fifty cents yes all that still <laughs> makes sense and now it's like oh my god we got days where it's 50 bucks and we're like okay these numbers don't work we can't do this we need to get onto you know different blockchains that are more uh, affordable and and so I mean yeah we would definitely look at it uh, and and ultimately uh, we'd like to have as many different uh, platforms supported as possible and enable uh, you know e each time we support a different blockchain it's like we have access then to their community and it's a great go to go to market strategy absolutely and that's about all I had jungle you got anything okay else? well I tell you what uh, you've been very generous with your time going through this. Um, I think what's interesting, we talked for a long time before we even got into tokenomics or the coin. I think that's important. We're talking about a real application here. So I will uh, post down below uh, everything for pre-search and their Twitter and you know some of the exchanges if you're interested in the token. And uh, Colin, I just can't thank you enough for uh, just spending time with us and going over this uh, really, really exciting project. Yeah, yeah thank you so much for the opportunity. Honestly, great to meet you guys and really appreciate your support online and uh, the opportunity to connect with your communities. So uh, excited to see you guys around and, and yeah, let us know uh, what we can do. And, and yeah, any opportunities that you have that you think are interesting, uh, definitely let us know. We're, we're interested in growing this thing uh, massively. So see what we can do. All right. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Have a good weekend, guys. Thank you. You, you, you too. too.